Tonight on Primetime Politics, Putin's war on Ukraine. President of the Federation. As the Russian president pushes ahead with his claims of annexation, we'll speak with Canada's ambassador to Ukraine. How can this country further help Kyiv in its efforts to take back territory and bring those responsible to justice? Also, you need a general review of emergency capabilities in this country. A warning from a former top national security advisor, is Ottawa taking its eye off the ball by using the military too often as a response to natural disaster? And it's time for change. Federal officials are responding to Hockey Quebec after the organization pulls its support and expresses doubt about the leadership of Hockey Canada. This is Primetime Politics. Hello, everyone. I'm Michael Sarabio. Decrees finalizing Russia's so-called annexation of Ukrainian territory were signed by Vladimir Putin today, a follow-up to a similar action late last week when the Russian president signed treaties with four eastern regions. Now, these are areas of Ukraine that have seen the heaviest and the deadliest of fighting since Putin began his illegal invasion of the country and territories that lie between Crimea and Russia. They are Kherson, Zaporizhzhia, Donetsk and Luhansk. But the move is being widely condemned by the West, and they come as Ukraine continues to drive back Russian forces. Well, joining us now to talk about the very latest is Canada's ambassador to Ukraine, Larissa Galatza. Ambassador, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Michael. Well, here we are talking just hours after the Russian president really formally signed into law Russia's supposed annexation of those Ukrainian regions. What's your reaction to that development out of Moscow? Fairly straightforward reaction, Michael. Those uh, sham referendums were uh, were sham, and everything that follows from them is as well. It's it's political theater. It's uh, the actions of uh, of, a, of a president who has lost control over a war that he started personally, and that many say he continues to uh, to manage personally. So um, there's 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 zero legitimacy to his actions today. Now, I do wonder, though, because whether or not the annexation is recognized by Kyiv, and clearly they do not, uh, the Western allies do not recognize the annexation either, but does the fact that Russia is declaring these areas a part of its territory now, will that in any way change the engagement of Russian troops in those areas? I can't speak for how Russia is going to engage what troops it has uh, it has left or it might be sending to those areas, but I can tell you it's going to uh, motivate even more uh, the Ukrainian soldiers who are working extremely hard already on three fronts to liberate territories and to get back to the Ukrainians who have been living uh, under occupation there. And I can tell you that is a, that is a real preoccupation here in Kyiv. Yesterday, I met with the minister responsible for reintegration of those temporarily occupied territories, and they're very, very concerned. Uh, for the last few days, uh, Russia has not allowed any people to leave uh, in humanitarian convoys or, or to get in and out, so they have blocked them off. And so the, the, the time, time is of the essence. Um, so they're highly motivated. The Ukrainian authorities want to get to those people and, uh, and, and, and get back every, every square inch of, of territory um, that is theirs. Mm -hmm. uh, highly motivated, as you say, and to that, the United States is committing more military aid, about $625 million worth in the latest promise. But we are hearing some reaction from the Kremlin, because the Kremlin is warning against further aid. Uh, with Russian forces in retreat in parts of Ukraine, Moscow says that any further military aid from the United States will make the U.S. a direct combatant in this, uh, uh, in this conflict. Should allies like Canada be worried about that kind of escalation in language? Canada and its allies are, are uh, laser focused on uh, showing a steadfast, strong, united front against Russia's aggression. And, and that's, that's what we're doing. And let's also pull back here and remember that, uh, that, that Putin and, and Russia, they've been making these claims and these warnings uh, from the, the very beginning, even from before. So 
that it's it's nothing new and uh, and Canada continues to work with its allies to show that strong resolve to be even stronger uh, as a result of uh, of of the of the political theater and and any dire warnings that uh, that Russia might be issuing Mm -hmm. Now, we did hear from the foreign minister last week, Melanie Jolie, saying that Canada does support Ukraine's accelerated admission to NATO. Uh, from your talks with Ukrainian officials, what are they saying about that? They're saying to us very clearly that nothing has changed about their desire to join NATO. And, uh, and last week, they restated that in a very formal way. And NATO, for its part, says nothing has changed about, uh, about the fact that the door is open to new members, uh, that the decision is up to the allies to make, and that no country has a say, uh, no one country has a say in, in who gets to, to join NATO. So uh, I think, again, it's this show of, of consistency, of consensus, of unity, uh, and, uh, and determination. Unity, as you say. So how quickly might that happen, do you think? And what kind of impact would that have on fighting the Russian invasion? Right now, that is job number one to fight the invasion with the resources that are being provided to, uh, to Ukrainian uh, armed forces, uh, by by all their partners, uh, and that's that's that is the focus for us. I can tell you for certain that that is also the number one priority for everyone here in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Ukraine is also asking for Canada's help on two other fronts. One has to do with war crimes; the other with landmines. And I do want to begin here with landmines first. Uh, President Zelensky wants Canada to lead an international effort to essentially clear its territory of landmines and shells left behind by Russian forces. Certainly, Canada has the expertise, but it also presents a dangerous undertaking. How is that request being received? Uh, the, the Ukrainians, uh, when they clear territory, when they liberate uh, territory, the first thing they have to do is clear the landmines. So you can just imagine what kind of a, what kind of a, of a challenge that is. But again, that has been a challenge for a very long time, and Canada has been supporting Ukraine with that uh, since uh, since 2015. Uh, so it's nice uh, and and great that U Ukraine is recognizing uh, our leadership in this area. Uh, we have been providing training, mine action, uh, education, uh, and also supporting organizations like the Halo Trust to be here in Ukraine to train Ukrainian miners and to do that absolutely painstaking work. I was out there a couple of weeks ago watching it myself. The asks are going to continue to come in. Prime Minister Trudeau announced in June that we'd, uh, we'd be committing another uh, $15 million to mine action in Ukraine. And we're working very closely with Ukrainians themselves, uh, because as you can imagine, the, the needs are much greater than that. So uh, the question now is how do we direct that assistance in the most, to the most priority areas uh, per, per Ukraine's requests? That assistance, but is there any talk of Canada perhaps increasing the assistance? Because uh, it seems that since Russia has begun this invasion, the number of mines, the number of shells left behind uh, on Ukrainian territory has increased exponentially. Yeah, that, that $15 million announcement in June was new assistance. Uh, and I think that we will but will there be an addition? But will there be an addition to that, given that the ask from Zelensky is more recent than June? I, we take all of these asks very seriously. Uh, I was, I've been talking with a number of people in Ottawa over the last couple of days, and what strikes me is just uh, how eagerly everyone is working, how, how faithfully everyone is working and, and incessantly to do what we can to, uh, to answer Ukraine's many requests. And, and landmines is an area we, we know well uh, and will continue to support Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Now, the other ask has to do with uh, setting up a military tribunal to prosecute the Russian military and its leaders for aggression specifically. So how would that be different than the investigation currently being conducted by the International Criminal Court? Canada was really, uh, really uh, um, proud to be uh, the country that took the uh, the reference to the International Criminal Court in the first place. And as you know, and Canadians know, we support the work of the International Criminal Court strongly. 
Um, the crime of aggression is, is one that we all want to see prosecuted. And uh, Ukraine has made a proposal in, in that regard. And we are, we and, and all of our like-mindeds are, are, uh, are taking a look at that and understanding its implications. It is really important that together we raise the costs of, uh, of aggression uh, and that we hold Russia and, and Vladimir Putin and all of his enablers to account for the invasion uh, and for all the atrocities that have been committed since. And we'll stop at nothing to do that. There are many avenues that we can, that we can take uh, and we're going to do that in lockstep with our partners uh, and with, uh, with the Ukrainians, of course. So, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that you believe that that tribunal, which Ukraine wants, will happen with Canadian participation. The crime of aggression needs to be tried. Uh, and that's what we're going to be, we're going to be reviewing Ukraine's proposal in that regard and, and getting back to them with, uh, with our thoughts on it. Ambassador Galatz, I really appreciate the time today. Thank you for it. Thank you so much. The leadership at Hockey Canada continues to be questioned in Ottawa today after Hockey Quebec decided to cut ties with the national organization. The provincial body is citing a loss of faith in Hockey Canada. And take a listen now to how the Prime Minister reacted to the development. It boggles the mind uh, that Hockey Canada is continuing to dig in its heels. Uh, parents across the country are losing faith have lost faith in Hockey Canada. Certainly, uh, politicians here in Ottawa have lost faith in Hockey Canada. Um, it's no surprise uh, that provincial organizations are questioning whether or not they want to continue supporting an organization that doesn't understand uh, how serious a situation it has contributed to causing. Um, you know, I really hope they understand because hockey is a really important sport to a lot of Canadians and a lot of kids. Uh, and right now, this mess is doing no favors to kids across the country. CPAC's Andrew Thompson joins us now from Parliament Hill. Uh, Andrew, good to see you. Listen, take us through a bit more of the political reaction to Hockey Quebec's decision and really the latest that we're also getting from Hockey Canada. Well, Michael, we've already heard the Prime Minister say his mind was boggled after hearing that Hockey Canada testimony yesterday and the interim chair, again, giving support to the current management team and even warning that major change could result in rink lights being turned off across Canada. Now, that testimony also led to Sport Minister Pascal Saint-Ange reiterating her call for management change and suggesting that provincial hockey associations needed to force the issue to clean house in her words. So here's how the minister reacted today after Hockey Quebec did just that and cut ties. I think that the decision that uh, Hockey Quebec took uh, shows that reform are being engaged. It also sends the message to the leaders of the organization that are holding on to their jobs, that Hockey Canada doesn't belong to them, it also belongs to their members, and they want change, they want a change of culture, and they, and they want a fight against sexual violence. So that's the, the Minister of Sport reacting to Hockey Quebec, saying it's lost confidence in Hockey Canada. But talk to us about the opposition parties. What did we hear from them? Right, so anyone following this story knows the condemnation of Hockey Canada has been a cross-party effort. And so Conservatives also applauding Hockey Quebec's moves uh, and saying they hope other provinces follow suit. But we did hear from one member of the Heritage Committee today who uh, wondered if other provinces will indeed also take that same step as Quebec. That's Kevin Waugh. And he says even Hockey Saskatchewan in his own province may continue supporting Hockey Canada. And he also made the point that in his mind, uh, the pressure on Hockey Canada is going to come most from the corporate sector. Have a look. As parliamentarians and even the sport minister, what can we do? Very little. They don't need the 6% funding from the federal government. What has to happen, and I think everybody realizes this, the sponsorships like Canadian Tire, like Tim Hortons, Scotia, Scotia Bank have to withdraw their sponsorship of Hockey Canada. That is the only way that gets corrected. They have millions of dollars. They can weather the storm for years. And this has to happen, that the sponsors stand up to Hockey Canada. That is the only way this gets rectified. 
So on one front, you have provincial players. On another, as we hear from uh, Mr. Wah there, uh, perhaps a corporate response to what's happening. And all of that really goes to the issue of transparency and also those calls for a change in Hockey Canada's leadership. And to that, Andrew, I'm wondering if you could talk to us a bit of what we heard from Jagmeet Singh. Right, Michael. The NDP leader asked about Hockey Quebec's uh, decision and as well about uh, the call that the Bloc Québécois has long been making, which is to hold an independent public inquiry into uh, Hockey Canada. Now, Jagmeet Singh saying that he found yesterday's committee testimony shocking. Here's more of what followed from the NDP leader. So rightly so, uh, people are appalled, people are upset, and we need to do everything we can to put pressure on Hockey Canada to change. It's clear right now that the leadership doesn't get it, and so calling for resignation of the leadership I think is appropriate and we'll, we'll support that call and we want to see action to, to end a culture that thinks it's okay to see violence against women continue. And so Michael that is the political reaction here today on Parliament Hill and now we await to see if other provincial associations follow the lead of Quebec. And certainly the story is not over yet Andrew so we'll speak again for now. Thank you CPAC's Andrew Thompson. Asking the Canadian forces, for example, to run a railway would be a mistake. Asking the Canadian forces to become overly involved in disaster assistance, in my view, is also a mistake, both, both because it affects the culture, but also because, as you know better than I do, or as well as I do, it affects their capabilities in an operational sense. So unity of purpose, I would argue, is a function is very, very important. A bit of Richard Fadden there as he appeared before a parliamentary committee yesterday discussing his concerns about the use of Canadian forces as a response to natural disasters. Now, Mr. Fadden is a former top national security advisor and his words reflect the view of many military officials who worry these domestic emergencies affect the combat ability of Canadian forces personnel. Mr. Fadden, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Now, I think there will be some people who may be surprised by your comments, given that Canadians are, as you know, very appreciative, very proud, when they actually see Canadian forces helping communities in time of need. So why is there this concern about the use of military assets as a response to natural disaster? Let me start by saying that there will always be some circumstances where it's necessary to draw on the military as the resource of last resort. Uh, my uh, the challenge, it seems to me, is the definition of last and last resort. Over the course of the last, I don't know, decade or so, we've seen a in significant increase in the number of natural disasters, or what are euphemistically called disruptive events. And increasingly, the military has been asked to involve itself in dealing with these events. There is nothing inherently wrong with this, unless you start worrying a little bit about the capacity of the Canadian forces to train operationally and to be ready to do what they're supposed to do as a military. Uh, I don't think the Canadian forces uh, today, and for some time now, have had sufficient resources, money and time, to train operationally. And if you put this in the context of the evolving geopolitical situation around the world, where it's more likely they'll be asked to go abroad to do things, for example, with NATO and Estonia, they need to be trained. And every time we draw on them uh, to do domestic things, it takes them away from operational training. Uh, Secondly, mm -hmm. I think it gives rise to the question of, are we doing enough on the civil side, federally, provincially, municipally, municipally and otherwise, uh, to make sure that there's a balance in who, who helps when we have these disasters? Okay, Let, uh, we'll pick up on that point in a second, Mr. Fadden, but I want to get back to your first, this idea that uh, having Canadian forces respond for all natural disasters takes them away from training. And that's based on what? The, the number of times the forces have been called in the, the past recent years? I think it's, it's a function of the number of times they've been called upon. It's also, I think, a function of the military having difficulty in recruiting the numbers that they want, that they need. So there are fewer people available to do disaster relief without being pulled away from operational training or from being abroad. It really is a variety of issues which suggests that they should only be used as a, as a resource of last resort. I want to emphasize again, I'm not against, I'm not arguing against their being used. I just think that we should make sure that non-military resources are being used 
uh, whenever it's possible to use them, and only when it's absolutely necessary do you recor have recourse to the military. Mm -hmm. But and, and you reference it a little bit off top, but if not the members of Canadian forces, who would be used? From a practical stance, is there really uh, any other entity in this country that can be mobilized as quickly and as effectively? Well, I think that gives rise to the question of why are the Canadian forces mobilized? And I think you can put into three large buckets how we use the military in, to deal with disruptive events. The first is logistical. The second is administrative. And the third is simply manpower, simply bodies of the sort that are being used right now in the Maritimes to cut trees and whatnot. In the first bucket, logistical, I think you could probably argue that, you know, using attack helicopters to move bedding across the country is not the best use of those resources. If you have no other option, then you use them for that purpose. But it seems to me that if we did more planning for disasters, if we involve the provinces, the municipalities, and the private sector, we could have standing contracts available that would permit uh, this sort of logistical support to take place or to originate from elsewhere than in D&D. And incidentally, given the cost of using D&D resources, if we do this carefully, we could probably save some money. Mm -hmm. I acknowledge that on the manpower side, if you just need a lot of bodies, D&D is ideal. Uh, but not every resource, uh, not every disaster calls for, for manpower of that sort. And in the middle, you know, what I call administrative work, it's registering people for, uh, to receive financial aid. It's registering people to give them uh, places to stay and whatnot. And I think we have to, to look at what we ask the Canadian forces to do in disasters in these three large buckets. And it would vary depending upon the circumstances. Well, and, and let me jump in because we're quickly losing time. But I do have to ask about any kind of international example from which Canada might learn. Because certainly the United States has uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They have FEMA. Is that something that you're talking about in, in terms of replacing what D&D currently does? What I'm arguing for is a for, the, for Canada to have a holistic look at emergency planning and disaster planning. It's something we haven't done for a long time, and I think it's something that we need to do to determine what is the best mechanism. The United States' use of FEMA worked very well for them in some circumstances, less well in others. I don't know if that's what we want to do here, but I do think that we could probably increase the collaboration, the cooperation between the level, three levels of government between civil society and between with the private sector. But it's unfair, I think, to give the prime minister, in the case of disasters, only one option, which is to call in the army. I think we need to think about how we might be able to do this in other ways. For example, uh, you know, the Canadian Red Cross and similar organizations have a vast capacity to mobilize people and resources. Is this fit into the, our disaster planning as much as it possibly could be? I don't know, but I think a public inquiry would help us determine this and possibly plan better for the future. Mr. Fadden, good to speak with you. Thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. As housing affordability continues to be a challenge for many people in this country, the YWCA was in Ottawa today to raise awareness about how the issue affects women and gender diverse individuals more acutely. Amanda Arella is here to talk about that. She is the Director for Public Policy for the YWCA Canada. Ms. Arella, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Happy to be here, Michael. Now, talking about today, uh, the YWCA says that the housing crisis in this country is deeply gendered. Uh, what do you mean by that? What we mean is that women and gender diverse people across Canada are experiencing the most significant housing need in the country. So in addition to the fact that emergency violence shelters across Canada are completely overwhelmed and having to turn away over a thousand uh, women and their children every night, uh, we also know that one in four women led single parent households are living in housing that's deeply unaffordable, um, inadequate or doesn't otherwise meet their needs. And the policy so far, as you see, it doesn't respond to that distinction. 
That's right. So the National Housing Strategy has um, committed to 25% of their funding being dedicated to women-led um, housing projects. However, what we're actually seeing is that there's only a minimal amount of investment going to buildings that are dedicated to the purpose of housing women, gender diverse people and their families. And so we're really here calling on the federal government to recommit to their um, investment in gender equity under the National Housing Strategy. So what would that look like? Would it be, for example, co-op housing that is uh, particularly focused on women and gender diverse people? Would it be, uh, for example, a, a grant program? What exactly are you looking for here? So specifically, we are looking for a grant program from the federal government, um, and not only for permanent affordable housing, but also emergency shelters and transitional housing, because what we're seeing is that uh, often it's women leaving situations of violence who end up in uh, domestic violence or emergency shelter and need a safe place to move to and transition to um, as they re rebuild their lives. But in addition, um, just and many women are not able to afford the housing rates and rental rates um, in cities across Canada. And so we're looking for the federal government to commit to funding um, non-for-profit housing projects across that full spectrum. I want to pick up on what you referenced there about the domestic violence centers, as you said, increasingly overwhelmed. But is that a result of the pandemic or is that the result of chronic underfunding? I think it's really both. So we have seen that domestic violence shelters are being chronically underfunded and have been for many years. And over the course of the pandemic, when home was not a safe place for many women and their families, um, demand increased. And unfortunately, there was just no ability to uh, increase capacity correspondingly. Mm -hmm. And I, I think also important to note the fact that when you talk about the need that you are hoping to address, it's not just among women, but also gender diverse individuals. Why the importance of that distinction? Yeah, so we at the YWCA believe in centering not only women, but also gender diverse folks uh, in our work because it's not only women that experience gender based violence and too often the services that exist, um, whether general services or services for women are not meeting the needs of gender diverse people. And so making sure that as we build inclusive policies towards gender equity um, in housing, but also in other services, we're keeping gender diverse folks in mind. So here you are uh, in Ottawa talking to parliamentarians uh, about the issue. What's been the response so far? Are, are you hopeful that there'll be some action based on your meetings? Yeah, we felt very encouraged in our conversations with uh, parliamentarians of all political parties. I think that there is a real understanding that there's still a great need for housing, particularly among women and gender diverse people. And of course, um, more than just a positive reception, we are hoping for action on this. So really looking forward to what the government will commit in the next budget. Okay, well, we'll be watching. Ms. Arella, thank you so much for talking to us and sharing uh, your thoughts today. Thanks so much. That's our program tonight. For everyone here, thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Serapio. We'll see you tomorrow.